Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is April 26, 2010, and my guest is Nassim Taleb, author of Fooled by Randomness and the Black Swan. Nassim, welcome back to Econ Talk. Oh, thanks for inviting me again. This is my third visit. And, yes, and it every is. Time, and, and every time something develops between two visits. That's great. And, and I think that I've had, uh, between the last visit and, and this conversation, uh, the most, uh, uh, it has been the most interesting period in, in my entire life. Wow. Well, our topic today is a new essay you've written that is going to be the epilogue to a new edition of The Black Swan that's coming out in two weeks. And in Europe, it'll be a standalone book. It's a postmortem of sorts on the book and the events of the last two years in light of, of The Black Swan's ideas. The essay is filled with interesting ideas, and I want to start with the idea that the crisis of 2008 was uninteresting to you, which puts you in a very small group. Most people think it is a a landmark, world-changing milestone of a negative sort, but something that we have to learn from, et cetera, and you have a different perspective. Yes, I mean, I learned more from the crisis of 1987, from the stock market crash of 1987, than anything else. And, uh, you know, that we had an outlier, a very severe outlier then. The world was more robust at the time, but uh, it was still, it was much more significant an event than the last crisis. And we've had a lot more shocks in history, except that it happens that memory is short for reasons uh, I'll explain later related to uh, uh, education, um, related to the fact that um, professors don't have the incentive to focus on the techne, they focus on the episteme. In other words, they don't focus on the no um, uh, how, they focus on no what. And history is an accumulation of small stories and tricks you can't compress into an equation. So people forget history, but if you take history, and a lot of people have done it, this crisis should have taught us, I mean, it taught me nothing, and, uh, and, and I don't insist on it, except as a simple um, test case. You see, it's a simple, uh, it, it sort of builds the argument, but, but, but nothing that did not happen in the past. We've known about fragility. The, the, the new essay is called On Robustness and Fragility. We've known about the topic since the Babylonians. <laughs> yeah, slightly long time. Yeah, a long time. We've known about how debt fragilizes systems since the Babylonians. Uh, of course, it was forgotten. The Romans had to relearn it. Uh, you know, when people started waging wars uh, to satisfy debt obligations, and of course, it's codified in Islam, and and uh, it, it's it's an entire package of of things you don't do, and 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 you have negative advice. It's categorical, because uh, uh, we have picked up heuristics. Now, now anyone who has a grandmother, and that's what I wrote in the essay, sh- knows about the ills of debt. That that debt makes you fragile, makes you a slave. Uh, that is uh, not healthy for an economic system, and uh, and that you need to have the opposite of that, which is redundance, uh, to 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 make your life more stable. Uh, any grandmother would have, would have would have taught uh, you that, uh, you know, from experiences of stock of uh, of the crisis of 1929. Yet uh, we had that Modigliani Miller. Uh, all this optimization in economics, the post Samuelson, uh, you know, era of optimizing economics, where they take a very, very reduced uh, uh, class of things, and and they optimize, so it makes you a lot more fragile under perturbations, and and they can't teach uh, uh, robustness because it's too complex uh, for them. They can teach you simple tricks, and these simple tricks usually fragilize. So they teach you to have debt because it seems to be optimal. Uh, it's in Hamlet also. Polonius uh, advised Laertes, neither a bar nor a lender be. Exactly. Uh, they're, 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 they're quoting, they're going back to the Septuagint. Yeah. You see, the, 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 all Mediterranean religions had um, either an implicit or explicit uh, uh, ban uh, you know, of, um, on uh, debt. Uh, the Jewish religion uh, did away with it later on. Uh, well, they made it easier. Was, they made sorry? it the, the, under Judaism. Uh, Interest is, was to a fellow Jew was frowned on. Uh, there, there were ways put in place to try to get around that, but it's clear that the that the prohibition initially certainly discouraged borrowing and lending. 
I mean, in, in, in the Arabs had the same. Uh, Arabs copied. Uh, I mean, copied. It's uh, to, to me, it's like a continuation of the Jewish religion. The Arabs had this ban on debt, and and when you had lent someone, it had to be humiliating for the person, uh, sort of an acceptance of defeat by by not letting them pay you interest. Mm-hmm. Interesting. You see, so so the person not being able to pay you interest is forced to accept a, a failing somewhere. And I'm very surprised that all these economic textbooks, all these studies in behavioral finance and in, uh, in, in behavioral, uh, uh, you know, uh, biases, all these studies, nobody, nobody gave a thought to the idea that overconfidence translates maps one to one into accumulation of debt. Yeah, it's interesting. Because someone who knows the future will necessarily borrow. What's the point? I know I'm going to make an 8% return, and, and uh, if I underestimate my error rate, I will know with certainty I'm going to make an 8% return. So if I borrow at 5%, you see, I can leverage up the wazoo. Yeah, and also uh, my salary is going up because I'm so smart. I'm going to keep making lots of money, so my ability to repay my debt will be very strong. Exactly, yeah. That was a permanent income by Friedman. So, so, but, but it's, it's incredible how when you make uh, all these uh, things without including an error rate in your projection – uh, that uh, becomes the solution because it's vastly more optimal than dilute your returns. And the same thing for government. Governments, of course, the French government have had now a deficit for 39 years. And, of course, I'm, I'm certain that uh, that uh, it won't stop so <laughs> yeah. uh, anytime soon. And, and, and nobody ever intends, no government ever intends to have a permanent deficit, but, but they keep having deficits, and sometimes they also have some out uh, through inflation, but the their projections are usually, uh, uh, you know, marred with overconfidence. They have all these econometricians who produce forecasts, like the IMF and, and these people. Uh, you know, Greece is, has today a, at least 13% deficit uh, debt to GDP, no? They're doing great. Or they were forecasting 3%. They're doing great. <laughs> you see, they're forecasting three percent. So, uh, um, what, what, what I uh, my problem with forecasting is mapped one to one with debt. Well, you know, the, the more uh, confident about forecasting, the more you're going to have debt. The CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, uh, projected that uh, in 2016, the Social Security revenue from the payroll tax would, for the first time, be less than the money going out the door to retirees. Unfortunately, that occurred this year. They were only off by six years. I don't know when the forecast was originally made, but uh, this was a surprise to them. Uh, they were quite a surprise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I went. I went to D.C. for a uh, uh, for a lecture. It was supposed to be uh, in two parts. I'm still uh, waiting for that. Was in 2006. I'm still waiting for the invitation for the second part. It never came. Mm. But I spoke to these. Uh, uh, people and and they told me well if we can't forecast what should we do all right it didn't nobody realized well first of all i told them you should get another job because you yeah. know if you have any ethics to an honest but, honest way to make a living exactly no, but the other thing that people don't realize the following is that i want to live in a society in which human error doesn't penalize the, the multitude and, and that's what I want. This is uh, there, there is and 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 that was the topic of uh, my essay. And this is pretty much my mission for the rest of my life: is is try to f- figure out how to build a society in which people can make mistakes. Yeah, you see, you, mistakes are are inconsequential. That's my tinkering idea because you make a lot of small mistakes. So society as a whole should be able to make a lot of mistakes. We want to Without encourage. We want to encourage mistakes, actually. Exactly. It encourage small mistakes. It's like an option. You it's learn. a discovery. You right, don't you even learn. know uh, if it's a mistake. It's, uh, we call it mistake. It's, uh, anything of small cost is not a mistake. It's a discovery. Price for an option. Price for information. But at the same time, uh, large mistakes uh, are crippling. And, we are, uh, and, and uh, what I explained in my essay is that we've had two things going. Uh, the problem of forecasting has increased dramatically over the past 25 years because random variables became a lot more uh, what I call fat-tailed, uh, thanks to the Internet. And why? Well, something I call complexification. Complexification, when you have interdependence, you no longer reach central limit. Because if I start buying a certain um, movie in New York in response to people uh, buying the, that movie in, in uh, Spain, you see, 
I am no longer uh, independent. So, so variables uh, become a, a lot more fat-tailed, in other words, uh, uh, prone to extreme events. So we've had that rising since the Internet. And uh, that was in the, in the third uh, part of the Black Swan. That was sort of the main topic, is that we were moving into an environment in which the structure of, of uh, uh, the randomness was becoming uh, freer of normal natural constraints. So it's impossible to use really models to forecast fat tails. Okay, except for very vague things I call uh, gray swans. So we've had that complexification of the world rising continuously, while at the same time having more fragility in the world through either optimization or and or uh, uh, I mean more government uh, role as we can see uh, optimization, but 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 mostly debt. The rise of debt has been monstrous. And. So, Yes. That makes that make, I want to come back to that, but that makes forecasting difficult. And I, I would just want to let you talk a little bit more about the reaction that you get when you tell people that you shouldn't forecast. I like the metaphor you use in the essay is, well, it's better to have some map than no map. And uh, you you point out that's not true. It's not true at all. Okay. I mean, the, the, what I said is uh, something I don't understand is that if I'm on a plane in Atlanta and, and they made the announcement, well, we're sorry, we're flying to New York, but uh, the pilot uh, can't find a map of New York, we just said, you know, given that, that uh, we need something else, okay, we're going to use the map of, uh, of uh, Chicago Airport, yeah. okay? <laughs> so you'd get off the plane, you'd cancel your flight, no? You would yeah. take the train. Anybody equipped with a brain... Uh, would do that, you see. Now uh, the 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 problem I've had. No, I came up, you know, against, against all this establishment. They said, "Well, you're against portfolio theory. Give us something else." Right. <laughs> There's nothing else. Small probabilities are not measurable. They're not measurable empirically, and even if you have the right model, small calibration error explode in small probabilities. So as I already said this, you've got to be protected from small probabilities. Then I came up with this idea, uh, thanks to Danny Kahneman, is instead of telling people this is what doesn't work, <laughs> people get offended, particularly when they've invested all their lives in it. I did the opposite. I went and uh, uh, I, I built what I call the four quadrants, which is a map of where uh, uh, your errors are not consequential, and where conventional statistics and forecasting methods work. And if you tell people this is where your techniques work, but even though there's this little corner where they don't work, they're not going to be offended. They're actually right. going to be very friendly. Right, because you've told them how smart they are. You've told them how smart they are. It's exactly like instead of telling people, telling them it's, uh, 70, uh, uh, it's 30% fat, you tell them it's 70% fat free. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's framing, it's just reframing the problem. So I wrote that fourth quadrant. By telling them this is where the techniques work beautifully, except here, and this is the fourth quadrant. This place monsters lie, yeah. Exactly. And, and in the fourth quadrant, you cannot afford uh, to, to, to use a map, a wrong map, because small little errors are going to crash a plane. And effectively, it's everything, all the mistakes we've had in forecasting come from the fourth quadrant. And in the fourth quadrant, you need something else, uh, what I call a robustness, and you can't forecast. Now... I want to live in a, we, unfortunately, I want to live in a more robust society, but the first thing I gotta do is get rid of expert problems because they make the society more fragile. And let me tell you what happened recently. I was in Korea, and there was a gentleman who's a number two of the IMF, and, and I got into a state of rage because a gentleman, uh, we were in a panel, and, uh, and I was already tense because there was an economist sitting next to me. Oh, I'm so sorry. Who, who likes deficits, okay? <laughs> and, and he thinks, it's, uh, yeah, it's necessary because uh, we need, uh, you know, to get out of the crisis. And, and when I hear the word deficits, um, I, I, I realize these people don't know history because, you know, deficits are a very dangerous thing. Anyway, uh, the, the, particularly that nobody has a father in law left you can tap, you know. Yeah, I, we're so, going to bail out Greece and then we'll get bailed out by Mars, Mars or exactly, you know, but, yeah, the, Neptune. The, even the Germans need bailouts. Yeah, <laughs> okay. it's coming. Uh, so, so the gentleman from the IMF, I was tense, but the gentleman from the IMF stood up and uh, started, gave his two, three minutes uh, uh, preamble by giving the forecast for 2010, 11, 12, 13, and 14. <laughs> yeah. I could not, uh, uh, I couldn't wait for my turn. I got in a state of rage. I said, anyone in the room who's listening to this forecast, okay, without asking 
for what his forecasts for 2008 and 2009 were in 2001, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7, okay, needs to blow up again. Because I said, this, what, what I want is precisely a society where a gentleman like him can be as incompetent as he wants without it harming the multitude and innocent people. Yeah, the striking thing, I think we have a deep belief, uh, I know we have a deep belief, and I'm part, you know, I partly learned this from you, that, well, okay, so he didn't do a good job in 2003, or I didn't do a good job in 2003 predicting 2008, but now I have more data. See, the whole, the whole essence of the econometric um, priesthood is the idea that the bigger the sample, the more reliable the forecast. So yes, okay, we made some mistakes, but now we have more data. What I think, I, my view of that flaw is that we don't have any more data because the process that created the data is different than the process that existed before. So we have the same amount of data we had before. We don't have any more narrowing of the estimates, smaller standard errors. It's, it's an illusion. Yeah, no, you definitely have, uh, actually, uh, you have it right, uh, uh, the, the natural answer, and there are two points here to mention. The natural answer should be that uh, what we have is more fat tails because the process that generates more data is causing more unreliability for data because more fat tails, because information randomness is actually more fat tailed. And you can see it anyway. And uh, uh, I, I'm not against forecasting. You just have to make sure that, that you don't have small errors in there destroying the whole thing. So there are a lot of areas in which we can do some forecasting. That's, and to give you a little uh, 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 glimpse at, at what things we can forecast, for example, tomorrow when I'm looking out the window and I see a cloud, I can forecast the rain. Why? Because, uh, uh, you know, uh, rain forecasting doesn't, is not in a complex domain. Well, up to a point. I mean, uh, it depends how close it is. Up to one day or two days, it's mechanical. There's no mathematics involved. You see a cloud, <laughs> okay, or it's linear, whatever mass is linear. It's like I see a truck rolling down a hill, I know it's going to hit, you see. So it's not really forecasting, it's projection uh, extrapolation, very simple. This is why we're getting this right. But when you talk about the climate, it's a completely different matter because you have a lot of nonlinearities. Now, I'm very good at – I'm very confident that June, July, and August will be on average warmer than November, December, and January. But that's just not – we do know those things. We're very good at that. Those are almost always right. Yeah, yeah but, but I mean look at meteorology. They, they, they look at, uh, at, at the uh, clouds from a satellite. So there's no mathematical computation. What we're getting right – in, in looking at the future is something that's very simple, linear, uh, that you can see with the naked eye or you can uh, compute on the back of an envelope. Like, for example, a company can forecast its inventory in the very short term. Yeah. But, but then anything, and, and as you go out, like uh, the error uh, uh, becomes monstrous. And, and, and I explained in the Black Swan that uh, with that metaphor of the billiard ball, because of complexity of the errors, how, for example, forecasting uh, uh, something uh, 10 years down the road is, is, uh, has an error rate that is uh, like several billion times <laughs> your error rate you may have for a uh, five-day forecast. You see, people don't realize that. It, doesn't, it grows in, in a very vicious way. Uh, no company tries to project its inventory 10 years from now because they know it's a waste of time. The question is whether it's a waste of time six months from now. And I think, I think that's where the challenge lies in deciding what's worth forecasting, what isn't, and what you need to insulate yourself from. And I think the, the point you make in the essay, it's obviously an underlying point in the, in the book, uh, The Black Swan, is that uh, you need some redundancy. You, you, since you know that your errors – are going to grow over time, and since you know that your ability to predict the future is imperfect, and you know that tomorrow is not necessarily going to be like yesterday, you want to create – it doesn't mean give up. It means you need to create some redundancy. You need to create some sort of backstop other than the taxpayer, we hope, to take care of the, the uncertainty of the future. Exactly, yeah. So, so if, you impl uh, if you look at uh, uh, what's happening, uh, uh, it, it, it may force you into, I mean, you may be even more shocked when you look at what, uh, uh, government deficits, because just to, I, need, I have personal redundancy. In other words, I spend less than I earn. Uh, I, have, I have a big buffer, uh, probably, uh, you know, I'm not enough in my eyes, but, or I don't know, or maybe huge in, in other people's eyes. But you need to have a buffer, a redundancy. Now, governments should shoot for positive uh, uh, net revenues. You mean a surplus? A surplus. Should 
shoot for surplus, okay, because they're getting a worse deficit, just just so they don't get too big a deficit. <laughs> you see? Mm-hmm. And that's a, that, that's a redundancy measure. Instead of running the thing, I mean, they're sailing too close to the wind. And, and uh, well, all this is, 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 is good, but there's, there's the biggest mystery for me is that what I'm saying is obvious. Right. How come it doesn't register? How can people still listen to the number two man of the IMS talking about his forecast in the future when he never got anything right in the past? That's a good and, question. That's, yeah, and why are we building systems based on these forecasts? Well, I ask, you know, I, I find it strange that in the aftermath of the crisis, the demand for my services and my people want to talk to me has never been higher. And that's true of the economics profession in general. I, I, one answer, of course, is uh, just like it's better to – some would argue it's better to have a map of Chicago than no map at all, even if you're flying to New York. Some would say, well, if you're going to try to figure out what's going on in the economy, better to ask an economist than an electrician. But, you know, it's not obviously true. Um, I mean, I don't mind. I mean, people use astrologers uh, all the time, and it's not hurting anyone. It's a comfort. And, and, and alternative so. medicine, I don't think it's hurt, hurt, hurting a lot of people. If it lowers your anxiety, it lowers your anxiety. I just want to build a society in which these forecasts are not taken seriously. And the society has one shape, robustness, just like Mother Nature. And the example I give is uh, why, why you need a free, uh, you need an, uh, free or expensive option. You need an option. You need insurance. It's just like we have two lungs, um, two kidneys. Uh, an economist would, would just have one central kidney and people would borrow it because it's vastly more efficient, you see. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, or someone trained in... in, uh, in uh, financial engineering. In, in financial yeah. theory or yeah. in economics or optimization, all right? So, so what you have is perturbation under Mother Nature. We sur- we've survived, and companies also uh, that have survived, definitely I think that our companies are usually the only family-owned uh, companies that really survive in the long run. But the things that are robust are the perturbations. And it's very easy to build something. <laughs> we know how to do it. Just look at Mother Nature. So talk a little bit about that. So redundancies and obviously little, little or no debt would be another. Well, the debt is the opposite of redundancy, you see. It, 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 instead of I have $100 capital, I put 80, I, I hide 80, uh, what I call my barbell strategy in the black swan. I hide 80, and then I take a lot of risk with 20. Uh, someone, uh, say a banker, would 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 borrow uh, five hundred five or 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 maybe uh, three thousand, okay, and 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 take a huge amount of risk. You see, so redundancy is exact opposite of that. So let's let's talk about the debt issue and uh, and the appeal of that because I want to challenge your um, your viewpoint, which I've learned a lot from, but I, I want to give give you a chance to talk about another piece of it, which is the following. You talk about the um, the role of leverage and, and debt in how it's seductive and it, it increases your returns, but it leaves you vulnerable to collapse and death uh, as an institution, certainly. And that's um, – I would say that's the, uh, the Kahneman view that we're prone to uh, hubris, myopia, uh, rules of thumb that apply in one area, not in another – but Vernon Smith, who was the co-winner of the Nobel Prize that year, he, he has an alternative view. He, he accepts everything, I think, in the behavioral economics world, or most much of it. And he says people make mistakes. They, they misestimate. They, they're prone to framing issues. But he argues that markets punish people who make those mistakes. And I'm, on, I'm in the Vernon Smith camp. I think we've stopped markets from punishing people. We've stopped the natural feedback loops that would encourage people to learn from the dangers of debt, and as a result, we keep making the same mistakes. So is it just human nature or is it also some public policy errors that have uh, gotten rid of the natural feedback loops that would teach, let us learn something? Well, I'm in the Vernon Smith camp. I don't think that human biases are uh, uh, harmful in the natural environment. I think they exist. They just don't exist in a non-natural environment. And governments provide a non-natural uh, background. In other words, evolution does not preach. You know what it does? It destroys. Yeah, you don't get like there's no there are no do overs and not many do overs in nature. <laughs> exactly. So evolution, and... evolution. So it doesn't give you a second chance, and I don't like to give people a second chance. No, I mean I don't want to be given a second chance, and uh, uh, I, I just uh, okay. I've survived this crisis, okay, and now I have a higher tax bill. Those who lost money in this crisis 
have, uh, instead of making money during the crisis, have a, uh, a, a tax break, a bigger tax break. You get a check. You see? Yeah. Uh, Obama, for example, gave his cash for clunkers program. Uh, those who bought a bad car get, uh, I don't know, $3,000 back from the administration, but those who bought a good car uh, get nothing. Well, they pay for the $3,000, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so the, the, the other, they pay for it. The other thing is I was, uh, and, and I think large corporations eventually becomes, become, um, uh, start dictating to the states what they want. And I was uh, in a debate with a lady who's a chairperson of, uh, I think, PepsiCo, and, and her point is, I have 300,000 employees. Yeah. The last thing I want to hear is someone trying to hijack the state because they, they employ 300,000 people. Okay. Yeah, that's an argument against giving you money, unfortunately. Exactly. It's, it's, the, the, you've the misused, you're too big. You've you're, misused, you're too, yeah, you've misused the resources that, that you were entrusted with, and now it's time to let someone else employ those 300,000 people who could use them more, more effectively. Yeah, so, so it is. Uh, the, you have to favor the small guy because a big guy enters in collusion with the state automatically. Because the state, uh, that, that's, I mean, uh, socialism. That's uh, unfortunately what we have in America. Corporate. But the worst thing we've had here is that moral hazard. I think that, I mean, a lot of uh, in the beginning, libertarians start attacking my point that uh, small probabilities are. Uh, people take a lot of risk by small probability by saying the market knows how to price them. In fact, the market does not know how to price them, and there's a huge amount of moral hazard in a way. And the moral hazard is, uh, uh, you know, has shown itself. I mean, someone makes $200 million in bonuses, blows up, and uh, the hairdresser and, and the school teacher pay for it. Yeah. Uh, uh, subsequently, and he says, "Oh, the models, you know, showed no risk, and and and, and so on." So you have a. Um, uh, uh, the state has been tampering with the functioning of the system. I am convinced that with the state is not there, companies will self-destroy. Large companies will self-destroy. And the ones who survive are the small, robust uh, uh, units. Or the large ones that are more cautious because they've, they've learned something. And they're more... They're yeah, or, I, I mean, I, I think that large companies, and actually I've shown it in a paper recently, the large company, as a company becomes large, uh, it becomes more fragile to uh, ec- ec- uh, un- unseen shocks, vastly more, disproportionately more fragile. And I gave the example of the, the French company, Société Générale. Yeah. They had a, a, a rogue trader with $50 billion hidden in a drawer, and they had to liquidate that right away. When you're liquidating $50 billion, it costs you a lot more per unit than when you're liquidating $5 billion. Yeah. So, so when you concentrate companies, errors because of squeeze, squeezes are vastly more costly to the company. So eventually, and the same thing happened, you know, when we had the meteorite, the dead dinosaurs were there to go first, yeah. you see. It's more efficient to be large, but black swan shock type shocks unseen, uh, uh, you know, are going to hit you uh, harder than other people. You're less yeah. robust. Well, you mentioned... So, so large companies and large governments and large states and large empires, large everything, okay, are disproportionately more fragile. And I like nature to destroy them. Yeah. So I want uh, the, the, the nature to destroy uh, car companies early on so you and I don't pay for, uh, you know, more bonuses. Yeah, I'm with you. You I, see, and, and the same thing with banks. City banks would have been destroyed in 1982, 83. Yeah. You, you see? And it survived thanks to the state. So I'm in a camp of Vernon Smith. Yeah, or I mean, uh, at least I'm saying we issue. don't live in a natural environment in which uh, these biases normally are harmless. So it com- they, they, the biases get compounded under the state. Well, it's funny you mentioned Societe Generale. The name immediately rings a bell with me because they were the number one creditor of AIG. When the government bailed out AIG in September of 2008 – the number two creditor was Goldman Sachs. They they were owed fourteen billion dollars by AIG, and Society General. I can't remember the number, but it was more than fourteen billion. And of course, they they said, well, but but we insured, we insured. Of course, they insured with an insurer who was not capable of carrying out its obligations and was quote rated AAA because on paper, I don't know why they were rated AAA. They they were incapable of carrying out the keeping their promises, but they kept their promises anyway because the government. You and I paid for that money to go through AIG to Societe Generale and to um, and to and to uh, Goldman Sachs. It's, it's yeah. Horrible. You see, no, nothing has changed. But let me let me uh, let me t- uh, mention something about the banking system. People keep t- 
telling me about regulation, and, and, and uh, as I told you last conversation, regulation is largely what got us here, okay? Uh, because regulators, uh, you know, uh, allowed, uh, actually encouraged banks to take hidden risks rather and, and take less uh, visible risks. But uh, the, 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 the problem we have is that banks have a vested interest in growing and in growing debt in society. You see, there is a vested interest by a banker to create debt instruments, yeah. and and to make people, uh, uh, you know, play with debt instruments because that's their business. So, the the if you just let the banks destroy themselves, say, in, you know, now an adult lend money to another adult, why should your children and grandchildren and great grandchildren pay the price? Yeah. Okay, through deficits. If you let banks destroy themselves, okay, it's painful, maybe, uh, but again, I mean, that's nature. If you let them destroy them, then then things will get definancialized automatically. Yeah. You see, the, the the role of financial institution will be reduced organically, not through some measures that are going to make lawyers rich. I mean, regulation makes lawyers rich. I was a derivatives trader, okay? Uh, it was most of the business uh, we had uh, came, or the growth of derivatives came from uh, regulation. People built derivatives to go around or the letter of regulation. Yeah. So we have a this definancialization would happen automatically, but we're not let we're not letting it talk we're about not letting it. I mean, the, the the government now we're talking a year after, uh, a year and a half after the crisis uh, started, and and we're worse off because every all the ills are there compounded. Larger financial institutions, uh, uh, larger state roles. Um, more deficits, more fragility to forecasting, more people like this IMF uh, fellow forecasting, okay, and more dependence on e- 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 economists who never got anything right in uh, uh, substance in the past, okay. So as we're moving away from a natural state into something even more artificial, has more fragile, and and my fear is hyperinflation because yeah. all these people think that we understand policy. Um, uh, monetary policy. You, yeah, you, you, you say uh, you say here in the essay. I tried to explain the problems of errors in monetary policy under nonlinearities. You keep adding money with no result until there is hyperinflation or nothing. Governments should not be given toys they do not understand. Close quote. Yeah, well, that, that's that's what I'm fearing now that that we're going to have a deflation, and and of course the remedy is vastly worse. Yeah, it could be. I, I, I like – one of the the simple but deep ideas in your essay is um, the true-false is not really what matters. What we care about is the expected outcome. So you know, if it's easy to say we're going to get inflation, and a little inflation would be not so bad. It would be not so good, but it's not so bad. A hyperinflation can destroy society, can destroy civilization, and can be unbelievably destructive. So uh, too many of our models are about the probability of – X or Y, but it's the consequences of X and Y that matter. That's true. I, I started, uh, you know, I, I did uh, four. I did four things uh, of the past general conversation. I tried to channel my ideas into uh, four disciplines. The first one is econometric statistics, where they work, where they don't work, with my fourth quadrant approach. Um, the second one is a distinction between know what and know how. That was, you know, of course, Polanyi, Hayek had some of it, but, but there are a lot more people uh, involved that we don't hear about, from Wittgenstein to Burke to Oakshot. Um, the, the third one is uh, uh, robustness, of course, the third topic. And the fourth topic is epistemology, philosophy itself. I just realized... And, and that's a big thing, uh, that if you start uh, probabilizing epistemology a little more, you'd realize that true-false doesn't count at all in your decisions on your da- in daily life, except uh, in maybe the, what I call the first, the first or, uh, quadrant. Because n- there's no decision is based on true-false that's stripped of consequences outside of casinos. And, and it's shocking. For example, uh, people say, oh, do you have evidence of that? Do you have evidence that... Uh, <laughs> Uh, th- that, that the gentleman is a terrorist? No. So why are you searching him? <laughs> you see, we're searching him because of a very, very small probability that the gentleman may uh, be carrying weapons, and we don't want to take that risk because the consequence would be humongous. Right. So everything is, ba- uh, you know, all decisions you cannot analyze through false. I said it's like looking at the world in a two D dimension and two dimensions when the world is a third dimension. If you're a worm living in, you know, analyzing the world in two D, it's okay, maybe okay. But if you're a bird, you're gonna have problems. Yeah. 
you see. So uh, this uh, truncation of dimension in philosophy and epistemology has been very, very consequential because a lot of the logic that, 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 that uh, is, has been studied in, uh, well, in both mathematics and philosophy, uh, you know, a lot of that logic uh, is, is so incomplete as to be unusable. Well, where I'm very sympathetic to the behavioral ec- economics, behavioral finance, and and it's really a very you know Hayekian understanding that we're imperfect and that mistakes are important, is uh, we don't seem to be very good at that three dimensional thing. Our brains don't. We really struggle as as Homo sapiens to deal with that third dimension of of uncertainty generally and the consequences and the con- uh, uh, of various outcomes and the expected values of those outcomes. It doesn't Actually, come naturally to bad. us. Uh, we're not that bad. I, I may, I may uh, contradict... Uh, Cheer me uh, up. Cheer me uh, up. The, the guys, uh, we're not that bad because there's something people call dread risk. Yep. Uh, we That's are true. wired for uh, uh, some classes of risk avoidance. Paranoia, yeah. Yeah, but, I mean, <laughs> you, you, you sometimes, uh, if you, you overestimate the odds because uh, a vivid uh, scene or because you see something on television. And people think it's a mistake, but it's, it's because we have a mechanism to take into account uh, high consequential uh, rare events, true. Except, except that we don't live in the right habitat for that. So it, it goes haywire. It makes us overestimate uh, the odds of some event at the expense of others. Yeah. You see, for example, people uh, are afraid of sharks in San Diego, not realizing that the drive to the beach is vastly riskier, even if there were sharks in the water, Right. for example. Yeah, no, so they're, they're vivid. But that mechanism that people uh, criticize saying, oh, it's a dread risk, um, has served us well and is still serving us well because there's some risk, for example. Uh, I, I don't care about the computation of that Hadron Collider. I just don't want, I mean, don't want, don't want that to take place. There's some risks that you overestimate, and for good reason, because one day, that mechanism of overestimating some risks, one day will serve you well in the future. So it has a survival advantage. So paranoia has a survival advantage. So does that explain why we find economists so uh, appealing, despite the number of times they failed us? It's, it's this desperate desire to find some comfort, some insurance, some, someone's taking care of us, someone has a model, someone has a theory. Uh, yeah, it's, it's the same thing uh, that we've had with medicine. You see, Mother yes, Nature is the best healer. And and we sort of know that intuitively, that Mother Nature is... Uh, but uh, when you're uh, sick, you like to use a doctor. So for a long time, and we know that in penicillin, seeing a doctor uh, statistically uh, uh, was uh, not a good thing. Okay, but it increased your chance of death. Right. Uh, particularly hospital, uh, and then thing increased with time. <laughs> instead of decreasing, hospitalization was 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 very bad for you, and and uh, and, and it quadruples the, the risk of death at some point. So, and doctors, of course, are using wrong techniques. But there's something, and in, in the literature, I mean, for my next book, Tinkering, I'm studying that problem, uh, that, that math problem. Uh, but in medicine, in medicine, people called it therapeutic nihilism. Is by saying it was always better to do something than do nothing. And it would accuse you of therapeutic nihilism for letting the patient uh, go his own way. Right. You see. So we've had that bias for acts of commission, not acts of omission. It's very, again, Even I think, when omission is better. I think, right, it's very, I think it's very hard for people to say, uh, we don't know what works, so I'm going to just do nothing. It's very difficult psychologically and emotionally for people to exactly. do Exactly. Unless you frame it by saying this is how Mother Nature heals automatically, in which case things work. Like I broke my nose recently running on rocks because, uh, you know, I'm trying to, uh, uh, between two conversations, I discovered, uh, uh, you know, that we live in a, in a richer uh, world and smooth surfaces aren't good. Okay, I, 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 I broke my nose. So I went to the hospital. They want me uh, to ice it. So I couldn't, uh, you know, I couldn't I don't understand why I needed to ice it. Mother Nature doesn't ice things. Obviously, if it wants my nose to swell, it's for a reason. No? I don't know. It depends on what you care about, I suppose. But then, but then I looked at it. There's absolutely no evidence that icing is, uh, <laughs> is good for you. <laughs> there's absolutely no evidence. It's good for the ice makers, I guess. It's yeah, a... it's probably. But we have this feeling, we, we humans have uh, this, uh, uh, our brain is an outgrowth of something that was very useful for a lot of things that can be, use, you know, dangerous in other things. So uh, there the are a lot of things 
Mother Nature does better than humans have been doing it for a long time. So as a statistician, people tell me, well, you have an N of one, okay? Right. The, the, but, but the N of nature is, is, is not an N of one. Is N is the largest N you can get. It's very large, yeah. Very large. If you put yourself in these conditions, okay, but you need to live as close to a natural state. And, and that's the thinking of Burke. That's the thinking of... Uh, a uh, lot of a uh, lot of people, including Polanyi, less Hayek to a much lesser extent. He was not as much of a conservative, but uh, I, I'm not a conservative. I'm a conservationist. Yeah. <laughs> By saying I want to follow uh, in the fourth quadrant in areas in which we're prone to large consequential errors, I want to follow uh, uh, Mother Nature or uh, what natural state that doesn't blow up. I want to let's talk about medicine for a minute because I find it very interesting. Obviously, the human body is a complex system. It's it's something akin to an economy. It's prone to unintended consequence, consequences when we intervene in it and meddle. There's complementarities and nonlinearities, very similar to economic policy. And yet, we've gotten better. I think. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong. We have gotten better at at healing the human body, and it, it's better now to go to a hospital for many things than not to go. So you're not suggesting that we should just let Mother Nature take its course if you get cancer or other – or if you – God forbid, instead of breaking your nose, you'd, you'd ripped open an artery because well, Mother Nature is going to let you die. The problem is we don't live in the natural habitat. What medicine has been uh, good at is correcting or uh, helping us live in spite of diseases of civilization. <laughs> I actually have one of my aphorisms is that technology – uh, makes us uh, live longer, but it punishes us by uh, make, making making us sicker. Mm -hmm. And and I think that since the, well, we know enough that since the invention of agriculture, the medical establishment has not been very good at understanding that we've been eating things uh, very unnatural to us. The problem we've had in history with medicine is the problem of rationalism. Is that we humans think since Aristotle that for. I mean, not since Aristotle, since before Aristotle, but with Aristotle that we understand the function of organs in the human body, when in fact we don't, you see. And we don't quite understand the human body. We never understood the human body. Uh, Mother Nature has been better than biologists at understanding the human body, okay? But we have had some breakthrough in life uh, in, in making people live longer yeah. uh, through, number one, crime, drop in crime rate. Better nutrition. Two, Sorry? Better nutrition in childhood is a major extender uh, of life. But, well, I mean, with the nutrition was vastly better before, before uh, agriculture. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but oh, I don't know but, about But it degraded. Uh, uh, we've had a little better nutrition, we've, and we've had penicillin. Yeah. And, and up until penicillin, uh, because of that error, the, what you call iatrogenics, iatrogenics is the harm done by the healer, uh, like bleeding and, and, and similar things, we have had uh, a uh, bad track record of medicine. And even today, I suspect we have a very bad track record of medicine. And the first one is people tell you to have three meals a day. And in fact, uh, no animal uh, eats to work out. You see, you hunt to eat. Yeah. And effectively, if you look empirically, nobody has tested it. And in fact, the test, what tests have been done uh, show the opposite. That, that periods of starvation are good for the human body for a lot of reasons, but uh, so empirically people are healthier when they go through periods of starvation, and religions know that. Another uh, thing that uh, I discovered, I, started, uh, I have a chapter in, in the edition of Black Swan about the distribution of randomness in nature, how just like the economy should let companies go bust, you see, because it's sort of like robustify the others, and, and it's a nice mechanism, we should also have, within, within your body, you should be, uh, not, never eliminate stressors. And by having living in smooth surfaces with uh, air conditioning and, and using cars. Elevators. We, and, and elevators and stuff like that. We have had the reduction of good stressors. Uh, and and that, is, uh, that is very risky because uh, we are weaker than our ancestors. We uh, antibiotics, for example, we are weaker than our ancestors. And I have a chapter, and, and the way I link it to the black swan, by looking at distribution of energy expenditure for a, a hunter-gatherer. Distribution of energy, like, I mean, sorry, the expansion of deficits, are, and, and usually they starve, and they're active while starving, so it compounds it. So they're looking for food desperately, yeah. Yeah, so effectively, the, 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 they get their food in a feast and famine way that's not steady, that's not mediocre stand at all. I mean, it's not bell curve. 
and and that distribution of uh, 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 that's what's natural for us. Right, you kill and, and, you kill a large animal, you get a big you get a big inflow of protein, and then you have lots of draws from the urn where you don't have anything at all. Exactly. Yes. So and 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 uh, and I started. So I, I spent I've spent now three to four years reading uh, papers on uh, on things on, on natural uh, uh, you know states of nature, whether for. Uh, uh, health or, or other things, and it's the same problem that crops up everywhere with humans using their own rationalism to try to impose their laws on uh, and, and makes us blind to empirical evidence. Like, for example, people think you get healthier jogging. You don't get healthier jogging. Not well, on smooth surfaces. Now, Sim, you're now channeling uh, Art Devaney, who was a guest on this program uh, a few weeks ago and was greeted with a lot of skepticism by the listening audience. So I, I know you're a small sample, but you've recently... According to your essay, you've been in trying to implement some of those ideas for yourself, correct? Yes. How's it going? Well, uh, I mean, uh, about uh, between the first conversation and this one, 25 pounds. <laughs> <laughs> in the right direction, I assume. In the right direction. I mean, uh, uh, 25 pounds of uh, the beds, the adipose tissue. You're a smaller firm. You're not a larger firm. Uh, yes, I mean, or, or smaller. Whatever is, is, is smaller is, is what's not uh, what doesn't count. Okay, the smaller fat. <laughs> I uh -huh. mean, smaller excess excess weight uh, of the bad uh, bad excess weight. Uh, more fitness, uh, but also I think that uh, the brain works better. I I started uh, uh, walking a lot, about twenty hours a week, and uh, as flaneur. But you're, you're, without effort. Yeah, you're strolling. You're not. You're not doing the po American power walk with the ankle weights. No, it has to be effortless. I mean, my life needs to be effortless and driven by external stimuli, stimuli. And and uh, my writing. I mean, I wrote uh, when I, I wrote in, in two or three weeks, uh, close to 100 pages for that edition of the Black Swan. And and uh, I noticed that I try to make no effort most of the time. And when I do something, I, it, it's natural for me to put a lot of effort in it, like writing. So uh, at it's the same, same time, concept of four-hour week. But at the same time, you're stressing yourself now and then, correct? Uh, extreme stressors. Like, for example, I walk a lot and sprint a lot, uh, once in a while, but no jogging. Anything else? You uh, run on rocks, which has a, it turns out there's a black swan. You can break your nose. Yeah, you can break your nose, but it's, it's yeah, maybe it's good so for you once in a while. Yeah, it gives you okay. a little bit of color, you know. It makes you aware of, uh, okay, uh, no, I, I'm trying to avoid smooth surfaces. Uh, I try uh, to avoid gyms. Like, that's one thing where I may disagree with art. Art uses a gym. He does, To avoid yeah. injury, and I don't mind. I want injury to direct my... Uh, <laughs> uh, it's already unnatural to just lift the weight unless you have a uh, an emotional drive to do so. So, are you doing anything physical like that besides sprinting? Uh, yeah, I lift uh, heavy objects. Uh -huh. I lift weight, heavy uh, weight, and I keep them over my head. I think it's informational, and uh, I mean, I've seen some literature on uh, on it. I don't uh, use uh, machines because you don't isolate the muscle or body part. Well, this is consistent with my wife's uh, version of, of Art's uh, theory, which is to you should sprint with a dead deer on your shoulders or at least carry it home, which would be more consistent with the hunter-gatherer experience. Um, exactly, but we lack the emotional uh, trigger, which you don't have uh, when you go to a gym. Yes, Because this is typically true. you have something uh, uh, driving you. We lack that. Yeah. Uh, we lack that, but but uh, I've been lifting. I've been doing Olympic weightlifting a little bit, only using the technique so I don't break my back. But uh, uh, things like that, and, and I've seen a severe. Uh, I mean, uh, difference. I mean, very very significant differences. I hope it's not confirmation bias. It's. Um, I mean, I'm gonna go back to Mother Nature where I say the. the, and the I have a footnote there on the difference in confirmation and disconfirmation in domains. Yeah. You see, I'm using an end that's monstrous. Well, I yeah, that's true. It's Mother true. Nature and Endless Monstrous, what we're supposed to do. The, 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 the human knowledge is too limited. So I, uh, and, and I link it, of course, to my problem of techne epistemy, know what, know how. Uh, Mother Nature knows how. Humans try to know what. It doesn't work very well in complex domains. It may work in linear domain, and we have exhausted the linear domain. We're really good at that, actually. Yeah, we've exhausted. I mean, people tell you, oh, we can put a man on the moon. Of course, government can put a man on the moon. They know nothing about volcanoes, <laughs> right? Yeah. They, of course, they they do what they can, not what they need to, and they're the most sensational. Okay. Yeah, I'm glad we put a man on the moon. I got a kick out of it, but it's um, it's really not that practical for everyday life. Um, 
Let's let's talk a little bit about tinkering and your next project. Uh, what about tinkering are you thinking about? Um, but I'm looking at convexity, okay, as, as part of robustness. It's all the same idea. Uh, yeah, you confessed before we started the conversation the, a rare confession from a, a public intellectual, which is you, have, you said you had only one idea, which is really – you shouldn't say that, even privately. Well, this, I only have one idea. I say it openly. I, so I continue uh, uh, developments around my idea because you can't really get your idea. It takes maybe 30, 40, 50 years to get your idea, you see. Mandelbrot was in his 60s or 70s when he figured out what his idea was, rugosity, which is uh, reverse smoothness, <laughs> okay? Mm-hmm. And I have my, my idea. I don't know what it is, but I keep continuing. So people say, oh, what are we writing about? I, I write about the same thing, but every time it's a different uh, uh, application or different manifestation, you see? Sure. The black swan is not the central idea. The central idea is convexity. <laughs> Try to explain that. Uh, convexity is uh, very simple. It's from... from it's linked to the black swan. It's linked to a lot of things. Convexity is when you lose a penny to make a dollar. Right? Convexity is when you're, the, being wrong doesn't cost you as much as uh, you get being right. Convexity is, uh, well, there's something called Jensen's inequality. An average of expectations is not the expectation of an average. And, and to, to put it in lay terms, um, if, if I, uh, convexity is knowing where the lack of knowledge is going to lead you. In other words, an option is a convex instrument. Yeah, it's really a, you know, when I, I was teasing you about having only one idea. I, what, what, what I find fascinating about economics, the part of economics that I love dearly, is how very simple ideas are very, very deep and how you think you understand something and 10 years can pass and you realize you didn't really grasp what it meant for uh, the idea of emergent uh, behavior. It's a very simple idea. You can describe it in a paragraph. To understand it probably takes a lifetime. It takes a, a lifetime. It's actually, my first book was on convexity. Uh-huh. On convexity of errors. So what I said, what I wrote in my first book called Dynamic Hedging, a very, very first book, so it's technical, and uh, I mean, for, for a long time, nobody could understand it, is what I meant is that if a model, take an economic model, and I was dealing with an actually a financial model, uh, option pricing or, or any, any form of model, you want to know if you're missing a variable, what impact it has on the total, you see? So that's, comp- con- that, that's what I call convexity. In other words, if, if the Black-Scholes option formula misses uh, a stochastic variable, okay, mm-hmm. what would it do? So, well, some options gain in price, ra- r- uh, small probabilities gain in price. Mm-hmm. So this is, this is my idea, small probability came from convexity. But it took me a long time to realize that was it. So now I'm, I'm looking at the application of convexity. You know, it's got a, it's got a certain relationship to, um, to Ed Lemer's work, who we've had on the program. I don't know if you know his work, but he wrote a very deep paper called Let's Take the Con Out of Econometrics. And the essential idea of that was that when we see a published paper and there's 27 variables uh, on the right-hand side to predict the Y variable on the left-hand side, we don't know how many permutations and combinations the author went through to get that final specification. So there could be variables missing. Uh, There could be variables in there that don't belong. And, of course, there's also variables we don't have data on, which is a whole separate problem. And what Lima recommends is looking at the range and sensitivity of the coefficients when we try all the different combinations just to see since we don't really know the true model. And it reminds me of your point about how when we take something out, if something's missing, we want to know something about how sensitive the results are, right? Yeah, so so I'm looking at second-order effects is that I know something's got to be missing, (laughs) and it's not a big deal. Yeah, but I want to know if my estimation errors help me or not. When I buy an option, and and that was my business. I mean, I did that for for twenty years of my life. Okay, buy out of the money option, and and my reasoning was, and I'm discovering now how to formulate it. My reasoning was that if I'm wrong on the model, okay, the cost is close to zero. But if I'm right on a model, I have a, se- a, a second order effect. So there is an option I have on being wrong on a model. And that's what I meant by convexity. And that's the center of my work. So, I'm going to give you a very simple idea of how one you expand the model, all right? Go ahead. Say someone tells you, I have zero probability. That event is, has zero probability. You agree? There are some events that have zero probability, no? Yes. Okay. And if he tells you this event has zero probability, okay, 
And he's not certain. Okay, he think I think it has zero probability. You already have a paradox. Yeah, sure. Because if it has zero probability, or if he's estimating zero probability, it means there's a permutation around that zero. No. Yeah. So necessarily, all kind of uncertainty about the method he has to compute the probability would raise it from zero because it can't be negative. That's complexity. Yeah, I, I have to confess when you asked me that the, when you said sort of offhand, you admit there's things with zero probability. I kind of had in the back of my mind, well, close to zero. <laughs> close to zero. There we go. So pretty, the minute pr- pretty much zero, practically zero. Okay, no. So, so my my my, uh, you, you can generalize it to things that whenever some people estimate something, you see, if you estimate the sales of a company for next uh, five years, okay, and. If it's a stochastic, if you stochasticize that number, make them stochastic, you're going to see the value of the company may rise dramatically. Because error around that estimate, okay, may raise the value of the company. Sure. Okay, even though your estimate may be right on average. This is what I call second order effect. Mm -hmm. You see? I mean, of course, it shows, uh, uh, and when you say zero probability, second order effect means it's higher than zero in expectation. You see? So and the more uncertainty you have about the ways you computed that zero probability, the higher the probability it needs to be. That's sort of my, that was my reasoning without my being able to formulate it this way, my reasoning about 25 years ago. And, and when I wrote 20 years ago my book, Dynamic Hedging, that was, that was a center. Okay, if let's look at the effect of, of uh, errors on a model and what do they do, you see? Because I know the model is not perfect. Okay, I know. I have to accept it's not perfect. I just have to know what the, what the imperfections do to me. Well, the imperfections in a model, when the pilots are flying the plane, you know what they do to you. It's not going to be good. So you're concave. It's a reverse of convex. But but the the uh, the uh, so but the uh, errors in uh, pricing an option usually help you. So there's a second order effect always raises the value of an out of money option, and that was my reasoning. And where are you going to take it in the next in the next um, few years? What are you thinking about? Well, I mean, this is a black swan problem, right? This, this is a what? black swan problem raises some some, uh, and, and I was a trader based on that, and uh, and I'm uh, uh, now I have I'm a trader of hyperinflation, for example. Okay, and my idea of hyperinflation stemmed from that that I, I know that I have a huge model error, but there's some instruments that that, that will pick up monstrously in a disproportionate way if there's hyperinflation. See, a trader can get it, but explain why evolution works. Evolution works because it's a free option. It's convex. You know that uh, 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 a, a uh, mother nature doesn't uh, produce, a, knows it can't produce a perfect baby, so it goes through a lot of trials, trial and error. Yeah. And 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 some, very often the mother doesn't even know about spontaneous abortion. Sure, of course. Okay, so so Mother Nature, the way we've had growth, even growth of knowledge, growth of anything that works, comes from these permutations. Well, I'm going to take a lot of dimension. Number one, well, of course, we're libertarians, I guess. I, I hope you still are. Oh, yes. Okay, and I'm going to show why government funding of research has led nowhere except for marketing. Do you think that's true in every field? It inhibits, inhibits uh, trial and error uh, overall. I mean, we have the data, okay? I mean, Joel Mocher just wrote a book on, uh, on the Industrial Revolution. They try to find places in which knowledge, university knowledge, or government-sponsored research has helped, okay, as confirmation. Do the opposite. <laughs> There's been a lot of work that been, so, so people don't cite, like McKeon or David Edgerton, that shows really that we think that there's an arrow from science to technology. It looks like the opposite, from technology to science. So it's not science, technology, business. It's business, technology, science. That's how the arrow works. Well, I have to confess, Nassim, that when I hear you say we have the data, I get very nervous because you taught me among many, no, 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 many I mean, things to be... confirmatory sp- data. Oh, yeah. but, I mean, the, the, the first uh, uh, thing is you look in uh, how much uh, 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 we spent on uh, war on cancer and what did we get as compared to uh, uh, spontaneous discoveries made uh, outside that money spent for that object, okay? And is that, you think that... That's pretty, pretty black and white. That that's been a. I, I, I mean, we had this confirmatory thing that that uh, okay, universities. We could look at patents generated uh, and stuff like that. That universities are much better at public relations. And I'm not saying that the flow of knowledge is 100 percent from technology to science, from business to technology, technology to science. I'm saying it's not as much. 
uh, top-down knowledge as it is, uh, you know, as, as they claim. That's yeah, what, that, that's what that I is, had to prove. Yeah, that is not the myth. The myth is definitely that basic research won't be done by individuals, that there's no money in it. We have to have government-sponsored research in the sciences, in medicine, in economics, uh, because without that, no one will, will have an incentive to discover stuff on their own. And that is a, it's a silly argument. I mean, it's, it's a, uh, McKean showed uh, the Industrial Revolution was done by businessmen who were not uh, theoretical. I mean, you can see it in a lot of things. I mean, medicine is obvious, okay, uh, because medicine had to accept the fact that it was entirely heuristic uh, science that was not top down. Uh, and and uh, but but you can see it in uh, in a lot of a uh, lot of areas. I mean, so the industrial revolution, for example, came from a businessman. Germany was a top down, uh, you know, was behind England and was copying from England. Is that in Mokir's book? No, Mokir has the opposite idea that he calls it epistemic base. And actually, I always learn from people I disagree from. Because I went through every word he has written on the subject, Mokir, mm -hmm. and realized if that's what the argument against me, against my point is going to be, well, it looks like I have a home run. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You always have to read the opposite. It's like, well, uh, you know, in finance, I had to read all these uh, people, uh, you know, attacking my black swan idea. I know, but again. So it's, sort of, it's sort of like fooled by randomness. It's the same concept of fooled by randomness. In fooled by randomness, you show that people underestimate the amount of luck that goes into things. We overestimate the, the amount of skills. Well, it's the same, the same, same problem. Yeah. No, Except that sure. I call it convex luck. Convex luck is trial and error. It would cost you very little. You're exploiting the option of nature. And in a way, we're a lot better at doing outside the box than thinking outside the box. Yeah, it's the problem, of course, is that what we talked about earlier, the, the appeal and the seductiveness of experts uh, is also the appeal of design rather than trial and error. Obviously, it's better to have a theory and a plan than it is to just let uh, things happen and let uh, losers be thinned out and weeded out. But uh, that's not necessarily true. It may be to actually totally false. But yet I think politically there's a deep appeal to plans and um, top-down design rather than trial and error. What I, I what I, I think that we I mean my proposal in uh, in here and in tinkering will be but in here in this book that's coming out in a couple of weeks in in uh, Black Swan Plus m my proposal isn't so much to inhibit that because we humans okay if we want to have a shaman or if you want to have anyone you know to reduce our anxiety it's okay we just have to make sure that uh, the it's not increasing Black Swan risks. Those risks of, uh, you know, severe consequential events. That's why we want to make sure we're not in a position to be fragilized from it. So I don't mind people seeing an astrologist or seeing a pseudo-expert. I just don't want it to hurt us. Yeah, we're, well, we're not so good and at Going that. back one thing, uh, backwards to the, to the American um, Medical Association, when we talk about medicine, okay, look at the food pyramid today and listen to my talk, if, if it still exists online, 10 years from now, okay? Yeah. And look at the food pyramid they have that really produces. Now we know from the veiny and we know from the data, okay? And from Mother Nature, okay? So we have three. Uh, we have a lot three, more than and three, of course, three because our own uh, thing is they want you to eat carbs and they don't want you to eat saturated fat. Right. Well, uh, and they, they, a lot of things we think come from uh, fat, in fact, are diseases that come from carbs. And, and all these diseases of civilization, which includes uh, Syndrome X, you know, that raises uh, the risk of uh, heart problems, uh, blood pressure, all that thing, all the cluster, and, and you can see that they're, they're, they're favoring it. So they're well, making us sicker, and at the same time, they're charging us for the services right? yeah. so when you get sick. Well, one thing you do learn from econometrics are fancy words to describe some things, and multicollinearity is one of those words, and it just means... Some things go together and make it hard to figure out which one's responsible, and you can make a mistake and pick the wrong one. And that is a major uh, problem with, with with everything, with science and nutrition. Exactly, or with and with, uh, with uh, controlled experiments. Yeah. You see, sure, because you're 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 you're, you're controlling, uh, you know. But <laughs> like for example, of course, if I give more fat to someone with like max, he's going to get sicker. We're about out of time. Uh, tell me how you've dealt with the uh, fame and fortune that's come your way from your books. And you talk in your essay about being surrounded at, or threatened at least to be surrounded by phonies and others. Uh, how are you dealing with that? 
uh, I think better than I expected. Uh, I became very allergic to uh, politicians. I walked out uh, of people in Davos just at the middle of the dinner table, just left, you know, abruptly. Uh, I, uh, I have not been corrupted so far. I hope, please, if you see me uh, uh, getting corrupted, uh, remind me. I think I'm, I have a, a, I don't know, I, it, 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 I thought that fame was corruptive. Uh, in my case, it makes me feel um, uh, that, that I have a mission, and, and I should not, uh, I, I'm in the business saying things the way they are, I should continue. And, uh, and I had a few clashes with people and uh, walked out on them. And, and I, so now that I so far have not compromised. I, I was supposed to be in a delegation to go see, uh, 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 to go to the White House, and when I looked around, I saw Bob Rubin uh, uh, in it. I saw uh, some other similar people. Uh, uh, Myron Scholes was among them. I just walked out. I, I can't. There's things I would never do. So I think uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I never accepted to be incorruptible, but so far I haven't been corrupted. Oh, may that may that continue. It's. Uh, I hope it's true, and it's a rare. Uh, it's a rare skill. And an important one to keep your sanity. Yeah, uh, uh, thanks a lot. Maybe because uh, I don't really believe that that this is permanent. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> now, nothing is permanent, my nothing friend. Is permanent. Nothing is permanent, except what you think is uh, is, is uh, temporary. <laughs> so true. My guest today has been Nassim Taleb. Nassim, thanks for always being part of Econ Talk. Thank you very much. I'm very honored. Thanks. Thanks again. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.